Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I'm going to be interviewing the daughter of an 80s movie icon. I'm talking about Nancy Parsons, who played Ball Bricker in Porky's. I'm going to be interviewing her, her daughter, Elizabeth Hipwell. Elizabeth is an artist who's based in New York City, and I'm going to be talking to her about her mother today and uh, talking about Elizabeth herself being an artist as well. And I can't wait. It's going to be pretty cool, I think. And I've been a fan of her mother, uh, Nancy, for a long time. She passed away in 2001, unfortunately, and... um, she was always a really funny presence in movies and TV shows in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and especially the 80s was uh, where she really hit her stride with Porky's and Sudden Impact and many other movies and stuff, but all three Porky's movies she was in. So uh, yeah, here is my interview with Elizabeth Hipwell. Hi, Liz. Hey, Tony. I thought it was 1 o'clock, so I, I didn't answer. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I am great. Thank you for asking. It's such an honor, Liz, because um, I watched your mom and everything when I was growing up. And um, even though uh, she was known for playing women who were absolute nightmares, I thought she was very sexy and very funny. Oh, yeah. She was a very nice person, too. So it was great to kind of character for her. It was the opposite of who she was as a person. So. Yeah, she, she had a twinkle in her eye. Um, she was the, the Thelma Ritter of her day. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yes. So... Um, now, I, I know that she was um, born in Minnesota and everything, but did she start acting early on? Um, she, she did her first part in a play her senior year in high school at South Pasadena High School. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget the name of the play, but um, as a result, um, he got a full scholarship to um, to the Pasadena Playhouse. Oh, nice. She's able to go, yeah, she was able to go there and, um, and study acting for the uh, two-year program. Mm-hmm. And she, um, did a lot of plays while she was there. She, I think she did a play, um, with Imogene Copa. Oh. On the, on the main stage, and she's, like, supporting... And um, so 
she took some acting classes to put it towards, you know, doing the teaching degree and got straight A's and everything. And then she did some acting while she was there, um, there during their summer theater. And um, she then ended up getting a scholarship to UCLA mm-hmm. to finish her four years. And, um, and then at UCLA, because she she ended up getting straight A's at LACC. Anyway, then she went to UCLA and um, ended up staffing while she was at UCLA. And ended up getting tons of plays at UCLA and did the Hugh O'Brien Awards and, and got her agent for the Hugh O'Brien Awards and got, like, a, a few acting jobs that her first Mm-hmm. Um, job from the Hugh O'Brien Awards. He did the Seahorse in, in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And that was her first equity job. And within a month of getting her agent, she got her first bad job, which was on Beretta. Mm-hmm. And um, the, her agent, which ended up being her agent for the rest of her life, was Susan Smith, which is a really good um, boutique agency. And um, I think it was the same agency that Kathy Bates had, too. And um, he just kind of, all that time she's taken off, it's kind of like getting that kind of, um, having it happen all at once kind of like was made up for all that lost time, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. She was able to really um, get it going. Her, her acting career kind of started pretty quickly, and she ended up getting a, a bunch of episodic stuff like Charlie's Angels and and everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes there was there was like a lot of downtime as well. Mm-hmm. To do some odd jobs in between. Yeah. And and there would be, you know. Sometimes living off student loans, you know. Yeah. <laughs> my sister and I, we had, we had a hard time. But the first, like, job that she had that, like, where she made some good money, where she had actually buy a new car, was um, Motel Health. Yep. And, and then um, and then after Motel Health, the next big job, of course, was the Porky movies. Mm-hmm. And, um. And those were the ones that got her known to a, a wide audience and everything. And so she, um, and then, you know, from there, you know, everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry if I talk too much. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, but, but so by the time uh, she became a working actress in movies and TVs, uh, you were old enough to have seen her struggle. I mean, was she... Did she ever uh, get not very hopeful or down about um, not not making it? Oh, sometimes. I mean, I you know what it was. She had been through so much by the time it started happening. I think. Mm-hmm. I don't think she went through that same thing that a lot of young actors go through because it started happening for her in her thirties. Mm-hmm. You know, she got her agent when she was in her mid thirties. It didn't start, her career didn't start until her mid-30s, you know? Yeah. So she didn't have that same thing that young actors have at all. Mm-hmm. She had been through a lot of life stuff, so all that stuff that people get concerned about when they're young, she didn't have. So I think that was to her, that helped her in a way. Mm-hmm. So she was able to not let certain things distract her or... or Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just 
not the chin. It's the job, and I'm going to do my best. And so, as a result, I think free to help a lot. Mm -hmm. And she's able to really do her best because of that. She didn't have so much depending on it that sometimes get, can get in your way as an actor, as an artist. So she was able to, you know what I mean? Yeah. She, all the uh, pressure of uh, everything she had gone through when she was younger, it had, it had gone away by the time that she was starting to get acting work. Exactly, exactly. You know, she, she had her, her priorities were too, too much there. So mm -hmm. she, she had more freedom as, as, a, as, um, as an artist, I think. Mm hmm. Oh, that's good, though. Uh, her, her first movie, she played a, a singing patient, and I never promised you a rose garden. Yes. Yeah. With uh, Susan Terrell. Mm hmm. Yes. She said that was a very intense process working on that movie because sometimes they'd have people, you know, improvise when they're doing things and. She didn't really be into being mental patients and everything, and she, uh, but she, and she was saying, there's this young actress who's in it, it's really amazing, and she's going to really be a big, big well-known actress, and she's going to have an amazing career, and it's Kathleen Quinlan, and it's like, she was right, she sure was right about that. Mm hmm So, but she... Had an amazing time working on that movie. Mm -hmm. It was very intense. It was a very intense. They they treat even the people they did not want. Like, people they treated as actors, you know. Yeah. They wanted people to be believable in the background. In that in that movie. Mm hmm. Well, I I, I believe that there's no uh, small parts, only small actors. Exactly. That's why my mom always said, you know. Every part is important. It's not the size of your part. It's how you do it and what you put into it and your commitment to it. Mm -hmm. it that's what matters. Like, and character parts are often more interesting sometimes than the lead part. So. Yeah, that's very true. I believe that so much. And then she did uh, the classic slasher comedy Motel Hill. Yeah. <laughs> 
amazing yeah she got to work with uh rory calhoun uh-huh and uh they were, bu- they were buddies mm-hmm. and nina axelrod nina axelrod who's very sweet and and i just met her husband on that movie he's one of the producers yeah it's funny her um her brother was married to Ileana douglas and for legal reasons, she can't mention his name um, in interviews, which is quite funny because uh, hopefully I'm going to be interviewing her um, after the holidays. And uh, I, I, I would I would just love to ask ask her uh, what, what was it like having Nina Axelrod as a as a sister in law because I'm such a fan, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Wolfman oh, yeah. Wolfman Jack was in it. Yeah. Well, I remember just being fascinated by the chair that he sat on in that movie. That was a really cool chair, a big wooden chair. Yeah. Yeah, well, when he died, oh, God, I was so surprised because he was hella young, though, but he smoked a lot of cigarettes. Oh, I know, I know. But if my mom did, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my mom, she quit smoking in 2006. She did it for 35 years, and no one ever thought she was ever going to stop because she did so much. And I, I just still can't believe that she has stopped. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, my mom stopped five years before she passed. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really a hard addiction for her to kick. It really was. Even, even after bypass surgery, she Oh. I was like, oh my god, mom, you're crazy. But it's, it's a really, it's a terrible, I think, sometimes, I think worse than drugs, you know, it's yeah. really, it's terrible. It but is. I'm glad my sister and I never had, I mean, I smoked for a little bit, but I was like, what are you doing? You're crazy, Elizabeth, just stop, just stop. I did it for a year and then I stopped because I just, my throat like cl- closed, closed in on me every time I spoke. Cause I only did it socially and I thought to myself, what the fuck are you doing? You know? <laughs> The role that she is well known for is Ball Bricker in the Porky's movies. And, yeah. oh my God, when I was um, a year old, uh, we first got HBO and taped the first two Porky's movies, this is 1984, because uh, they were on all the time. Um, and then when I was uh, three years old, uh, we taped Porky's Revenge when it came on HBO. And I remember my dad caught me uh, watching it when I was like, I don't know, three, four years old, and he took the tape and threw it on the roof. <laughs> three or four? Oh my gosh. Wow. 
Yeah, it's like I, I was always destined to be a pervert. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. But, like, I, it's just amazing to me how, you know, this this movie became a successful franchise because, you know, it's got that, that B-movie quality to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny, you know, you look back on it now, and the actor was so much older. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but by the time they did Porky's Revenge, they really looked their age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, I mean, I just yeah, as I watch them now, you know, like I said, they're like they're like they're like B movies that became huge hits, and there weren't even any major stars attached to it, you know. Yeah. I mean, this. Very good actors, yeah. Well, um, uh, the first, the Broadway actor, he's in the first one, Tony. Oh, uh, Boyd Gaines, yeah. Yeah, he's won a bunch of Tony's. He, he's a wonderful actor. He's, he's in the first movie. Mm-hmm. He's like one of the gym teachers. He's the one who's laughing his mouth off in the gym office. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yep. Actors, you can. Oh, Eric Christmas. Yeah. He's been in Hills and Mod. I mean, he's an amazing actor, and so there's some really, really gem of actors in that movie. Mm-hmm. Boys, the boys are really good actors. So. Yeah. That's what he went with more than worrying about age and stuff. He went with finding really good actors. Yeah, and uh, I mean those classic penis scenes with the shower and the principal's office. I, I don't know how she kept a straight face during those scenes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> she didn't have this first take. Mm-hmm. Um, that principal scene and Bob Clark was like, uh, I think we have our take on that first. I we'll do a pickup shot. We'll do it one more time just in case we don't have it. Yeah, there's no way you could fake that laughter. It's too damn funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, when I saw it, I was like, I saw it. I, when I went to the screening at the studio, mm-hmm. it's like standing room only in some places, so I had to stand. I fell on the floor. I was laughing so hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, oh, my God. I was like, I can't see you just did that, Mom. Oh, my God. It's so funny. Yeah. And when, when, when she did the part in Shower, if you wanted to, you know, pull the penis through the wall. Yeah. And Bob was like, yeah, that time wasn't really happening in real life. She said, well, it's it's, it's, it's not being, of course, we're just going to suspend belief. I've got, I've got to believe me, it's going to be funny. You know, I'll take a rope and I'll just pull. Please pull someone. It's just, it's going to be funny. And then he said, okay, I'll do what you said. And I, I, I think she was right. It was hilarious when she did that. Especially with, with um, Tommy on the other end. Oh, my God. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how he felt about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the timing of how they did it was so perfect. Her and him, the, it, it looked like it was really happening. It was really perfectly timed. Mm-hmm. 
and you even had a role in uh, Porky's Revenge. What? You you even had a role in Porky's Revenge. Not really. I think a blip. Yeah. Yeah. By the time by the time she had done Porky's Revenge, she had lost a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they made her a little more glamorous than that at the end. Yeah. And she was. Well, she. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she was. Well, she was pretty, anyways. She she even played um, an old whore in uh, Pennies from Heaven. Yeah, she oh my god, she just raved about doing that to me because she loved being able to do a scene with Christopher Walken, and uh, she just couldn't believe what an amazing dancer he was, mm-hmm. and uh, that he had been a, a chorus boy before he became an actor. Yeah. And, uh, I like that movie. I, I think it's very underrated, and yeah, you know, I'm a guy who likes stuff that's dark, and I really like it. I yeah, I think so too. And as a result, kind of like got to have a good um, professional relationship with Tom Ross, then he ended up casting her again, and he cast her again in um, Still Yep. Yeah, yeah, because he really liked her. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, he, he comes. I mean, he comes from a Broadway background, and his wife was a choreographer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did some good movies, especially for Neil Simon. He directed a lot of his movies. Mm-hmm. I I forgot she was in Sudden Impact. Yeah, and she's she's on a trivial pursuit question with like, who's the only actor. Hold on, on Clint Eastwood, on Dirty Harry in the movie, and not end up being killed by Dirty Harry. Ah. Oh. My, my mom, and she was sudden impact. The fishmonger. Nancy Park knows she played the fishmonger in sudden impact. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, we found that out. A fan of hers sent her the real <laughs> Did she get along with Clint Eastwood? Um, I think he's very professional. He, she, he, she says that he kept his, his set very quiet and serene and, and very low key, and that like even even like even the crew is like very low key and quiet, and they don't do like a lot of yelling like on some set. Mm-hmm. She also did. There wasn't a lot of howling around. It was just very much like, let's just do the job and let's just go and let's just do it. And we're done. Okay. We're done. Okay, you know. Yeah. I, yeah, I heard he likes to shoot really fast and everything.
Sydney Lassick. Sydney Lassick, yeah. Yeah, he's a couch potato, and all these stars come out of the TV, like Richard Simmons and Gary Coleman and Sean Weatherly and Ed McMahon and Lyle Alzado and Barbara Billingsley. Yeah, it's a funny episode. Yeah. Oh, she's she's at her at her absolute nightmarish in that in that episode. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Jeff Cohen, who played Chunk in The Goonies, plays their son. Wow, I think she, I think she did that when I was at college. I didn't see it. I didn't mm-hmm. see it. I, I hated reading that, but I want to be truthful. I, I want to, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna see it now. I'm gonna try to see it to see if it's streaming somewhere. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I I I know the first is the, those well. There's only two seasons of Amazing Stories. They're both available on DVD. I know that, but um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna see it now. Now that you told me that, I did meet Sydney last one. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom ended up doing a reading of a screenplay with him, and I think Stu O'Reilly was part of it, and it was at Santa Marley's house. And John Marley was part of it too. And John Marley was like directing the reading. Mm-hmm. We were doing a reading um, for something. And and Sinelas was part of it. And we all were in the car. And Sinelas was very quirky but very nice. That's all I remember. Yeah, he always played characters like that. But he's known for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, he's he's a good actor. John Marley likes, John Marley likes to gather a lot of actors that he likes. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's sometimes for just to read a play or to read a screenplay at his house sometimes, and so that's what that was. Mm-hmm. The last time I saw her was in the Rodney Dangerfield movie Ladybugs. Yes, yeah, I remember her telling me about that. That was also when I was away at college. Mm-hmm. That was one of the last movies she did. Yeah. Yeah, my dad, my dad took me to see it, and we were the only two people in the theater. And oh my god. Yeah, and my dad thought that your mom was Alice Nunn, who played Large Marge in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh my gosh! Wow. Yeah, and then year, years later, when IMDb came, I found out that Alice Nunn had already died a couple of years before that, and. I found out that it was your mom. I said, no, Dad, that's Paul Bricker uh, from the Porky's movies. And he was like, wow, she lost a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. I think part of it was her losing weight for her house and also because of her house that she lost weight. Yeah. Um, been sick and everything. That was kind of the combo of both. Yeah. Is it, yeah, she, yeah she, she's the... Uh, uh, the the horrible soccer coach um, in the movie yeah. and Rodney's like insulting her, you know, saying, "Oh, she went to a dog show, she'd win," you know. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. So when she, when she um, now, so did she get sick and she couldn't work anymore? Yeah, she finally got way too sick. Um... And so my sister went out and helped close up her apartment and sell her car and just pack everything up. And my sister brought her back to Wisconsin mm-hmm. to live near her and help set up like medical care and help set up an apartment for her and just wanted her to be near her and the kids, but my, my mom to be near her grandkids. Yeah. Towards the end. So then she was able to be near her grandkids. And then the last few years of her life, because of that apartment where my mom lived in my sister's house, so that, you know, because her house was just way too bad. And she had to live there and have a hospital bed. And um, I visited once when she was in her apartment, and then I visited at the house um, before she passed. And... Um, 
she passed the hospital um, at the end um, in um, this fall. Mm-hmm. And we ended up, we ended up um, having her buried in um, where we're called the Chicago Mesa City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember the, the uh, hearing the news report. Um, it, it was so devastating. I was a senior in high school, and I was watching a lot of teen movies from the '80s during that period. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, she, I mean, she was so young, you know. I know she was fifty-seven, and that it kind of screwed me. A wake-up call because I hadn't been taking care of myself, and mm-hmm. I gained a lot of weight. And um, so I finally, I was my doctor, and my doctor, like, you know, gave me a wake-up call. And said, you need to lose weight. You need to stop. You need to eat a different way. Otherwise, you're going to have heart disease and have diabetes in two years. Mm-hmm. So I started changing things around, and I, excuse me, to lose about 135 pounds. And I am no longer at risk of diabetes anymore, and I am no longer at risk of heart disease. So I really, well, I, I felt that that was an honor to honor my parents. I cannot let that happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, that's, be- oh. that's beautiful. Yeah. What, what was she like at home? IQ. Right? IQ, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my, my IQ obviously isn't very smart. I can't think of it. Oh. <laughs> but he always encouraged us, you know, with school and um, he, you know, he, I'm sorry. I was getting a little, little lost in my thoughts right now. I haven't talked about my mom in a while, and it's mm-hmm. pretty emotional sometimes. Mm-hmm. Was she? Yeah. Uh, did she have a good sense of humor? Yeah, very. She had a very good sense of humor, and she was very good at holding court and and you know, talking and making jokes, and she's very body. Oh. Body.
Mm-hmm. She, did you inherit? Yeah. Did you inherit uh, her sense of humor? Was she, was she like a tomboy? No, not at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. She's different. She wasn't a tomboy, but she wasn't a girly girl either. She's very much like like a feminist. Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways. Wow. Yeah. But she, she, she was a survivor of a lot of things. She had a hard time growing up. Um, So when when you were growing up, did you want to be an actress too? Not until I was in my teens. I um, it was a way my mom had birthed it as a way to to get over because I was like really excessively shy. Mm-hmm. He encouraged me to take an acting class when I was in eighth grade, ninth grade, ninth grade to get over my shyness, and I just took to it. I just, I was really sensitive, and my sensitivity, like, kind of aided, kind of was just reacting. I was able to have empathy in the characters that I played, and as a result, it was made, the characters I played successful and everything, and I was able to do some acting, through that and everything, and uh, then throughout high school, I did some acting, and then in college, and uh, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You were you were a script supervisor on From the Hip. Yes, with Dan, Danny Marley, who had been um, who had done you know script supervision on the first two uh, Porky's movies, mm-hmm. and uh, he. And he asked me, because I had also babysat for her, he asked me uh, one summer if I would like to assist her um, on From the Hip. Mm-hmm. And I said, yep, sure, that would be a great summer job, you know, in between um, years at college. So I thought that would be awesome. And uh, so I did, and it was, it was a pretty cool experience. Because John Hurt was in it, and John Hurt was like, "Oh my God, John Hurt, amazing actor, Elephant Man, you know, and yeah. um, Midnight Express." I was like, "Alien, Alien, exactly." I was like, "Oh my God!" And I, I mean, the most I talked to him was like, "Can I take a picture of you for continuity, Mister Hurt?" You know, <laughs> 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 I was like, "Oh, yeah. you know, thanks for following." continuity 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't want to, you know, intrude on his face or bother him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, ah, oh, I didn't want to be fangirl or anything, you know, I thought that'd be kind of annoying. Yeah. So, um, but I was like, ah, oh, he's pretty cool. He's pretty cool. And I got to meet a young Elizabeth person starting out in her career, you know, having done about last night when she gained it. And, Ray Walston was the judge just before he was on Picket Fences. Yep, yep. He was great. I know. It was a pretty cool cast. It was a really cool cast that they had in that movie. Mm hmm. It sure was. When, when did you start painting? I started doing art as well. Mm-hmm. It's kind of more like um, it's more like a self thought kind of thing because um, for mm-hmm. art therapy because I, I have depression. Mm-hmm. Me too. And, and so it's it's a therapeutic thing, and then I just continue doing it, and I've sold some pieces, and I now I have an art studio, and I show pieces sometimes, and it just kind of took off from there, and it's like, it's like my, my self-imposed therapy now. I don't go to art therapy anymore, but I still do it for myself, mm-hmm. right? And I make sessions for myself, and I make pieces, and it's what I do me occupied and it's a healthy you know it's a healthy occupation rather than thinking doing unhealthy things so good thing uh, and I when I want to learn new things I just look it up and speak it to myself mm-hmm and that's good yeah. that's good you didn't go to art school because the the great actor Anthony Quinn uh, said if, if you go to art school, it takes away your creativity. But if you teach yourself uh, how to paint, you know, it, you know, it expands your creative mind. Exactly. And I think that kind of, I feel that way about going to acting school now. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm more creative acting than before I went to acting school. <laughs> <laughs> but after I went to acting school, Yeah. It's sad. So, yeah. I feel like it kind of, like, kind of, like, beat the love of acting out of me. So, it kind of, it was sad. But, um, but, I mean, my, it's my, it's my uncle, Philip, Philip Cicero, mm-hmm. was, was an artist. And he was a professional artist. And he, I guess they did a video of him talking about art, and they said, well, did you learn how to be an artist at art school? Because he went to the high school of visual arts in New York. And um, he said, no, I didn't learn how to be an artist at art school. They, he taught me these cool techniques, but he says, I learned how to be an artist by life. Life taught me how to be an artist. He says, but art school? He could use a few cool techniques. You take what you need and then what you don't need, you just kind of let it go. Says, but mm-hmm. you, learn, you learn how to be an artist by living your life. I think that's, that's true with any art. That's true with acting. That's true with any art. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So yeah, so, so you have your own gallery and all? I have a video on the spirit. It's a spirit video today. Mm-hmm. Um, at the Uptown Art Center mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. And we also have a spirit. We have a, like, the exhibit sometimes. And um, sometimes I'll, like, submit to different things to show my art and... I'm always, like, putting stuff up on Instagram of what I'm doing. Sometimes in process, I'll put stuff in process. I think it's safer to put stuff up on Instagram because you can't, like, you can't, like, re... You can't, like, download to the truth, you know? Yeah. So, that's what I do. But sometimes I'll even, like, have it put up on Twitter or, or Facebook just for fun. No, but I'm not worried about that kind of thing. It's not like I'm trying to do it professionally too much. I'm more trying to do it just for my own health. And to find it, if I end up selling something that's great, but, I, but I'm not trying to do it for that. That makes it less pressure that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if I do sell something that's like, oh, it's great, good, you know? But then the whole pressure about acting is like I'm too worried about things. Whereas with past art, with art I found that now I don't put that pressure on myself. Instead, I just do it to the love of it. And then if I end up selling something, I'm just like, oh, that's great, wonderful, but I'm not doing it. That's not the result I want. The result I want is just do it. And that makes it so much, I have more freedom because of that. So. Mm hmm yeah, I started going to art galleries um, about four years ago uh, because I found out that they had free alcohol. And I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I was at my absolute worst with drinking at the time, um, and I was homeless, and it was a really bad time for me to be doing that. And then I had um, yeah. a pretty bad car accident in January of 2015, and I, I can't drink again and stuff but i have gone to uh the art gallery since and i have like free coca-cola there <laughs> yeah that's true they, that's good that they have um i'm sorry i should have made that comment about like oh that's a good thing so i didn't say that so no it's okay it's okay i just it, it made sense at the time i wish i had known about it uh, before that I, it would have saved me a lot of uh, money on um, going to the bar <laughs> You know, but I, I do um, appreciate art, and I've seen uh, the drawings on your Facebook. They have a very new wavy Art Deco uh, look to them. Mm. You know, yeah. and you seem to explore dark territory, but maintaining um, an exposition of your soul. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I love that one you did. Um, it's like a black shadow of an adult, and it looks like it's screaming at a little girl that's curled up in a ball. Uh, that was a very therapeutic one. Mm-hmm. Very therapeutic one. Yeah. Yeah, that mm -hmm. uh, If you want to friend me on Facebook, you're welcome to it, okay? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really do like those pictures. Oh, you're welcome. In addition to painting pictures, though, uh, are you also uh, able to paint your toenails? What? Yeah. <laughs> I, tend, I tend to like to have those done by someone else. It's a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've been painting my toenails since I was 13. That's why I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, I do sometimes, but I like to have someone else do them. Because then they'll, they'll massage my feet, too. So that's even better. Oh yeah, that's that's awesome. I'm a good foot massager too. Um, I learned it from a friend of mine who's a massage therapist. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, I can tell from talking to you, Liz, that um, your mom would be very proud of you. Oh, that means so much to me. I can't tell you. It, I, the more I think about it, the more I realize how much she loves her a lot. Especially at the end, we've made up for a lot of stuff, and we were able to bring a lot of closure to a lot of things. And that's one of the reasons I got my I got one of my first cell phones, was so that we could talk long distance, because we got the free long distance, and we used to.
Oh, my pleasure. You know, I hope you have um, lots of other people that you could you could talk to in in the meantime. Yes, absolutely. You're very, you're very charming, Liz. Oh, really? Thank you. <laughs> yes, and you're you're pretty like your mom. Oh, that means a lot. Thank you. Yes, and uh, this has been such an honor. I, I feel like I've known you thirty years. Ah. <laughs> and. Yes, and and uh, I hope you I hope you had a good birthday the other day. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, fifty-four. Oh, I'm so happy to be nearing that age. You know. Yeah, is 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 that something that bothers you? Well, it's something I'm aware of. This is one of the things that kept me, made me, you know, be on top of my health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of the one of the great things about about getting older, though. It, it's it's a privilege, and you really appreciate it the, the older you get. Yeah, I I'm 35. I had my accident at 31, and I, I spent 30 days in a coma. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Thanks. and five months in the hospital, uh, and yeah, I just I wasn't expected to make it, and I did, and I I'm so grateful because I've had this podcast for 302 episodes, um, and. I've gotten to just meet incredible people that, you know, I grew up idolizing that I'd never thought I would ever get to meet. And it's just been so profound in my life. Oh, wow. That's great. Mm-hmm. I'm just so That's lucky. The name of your podcast? It's called Splat from the Past. Okay. Will you send me a link to it so I can put it up on my Facebook and on my mom's page? Oh, of course I would. Of course. Yes, yeah. I'd like to put a link on her Facebook page. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah, because my friend uh, Greg Gilbert had inter- interviewed you a couple years ago. Yes, he did. I re- oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I initially found out about you. He, li- he likes to track down the relatives of, of f- famous people who are past and interviewed them and stuff. And you're really the first one that I've that I've really uh, done in terms of you know being the focus of you know I mean I have interviewed you know uh, the relatives of famous people but they've mostly been in the business as well you know mm-hmm. and stuff yeah. but yeah I thought you and him did a really good interview and so I was like yeah I got to interview her too I could just hear it in in your voice you know just how charming you are. My pleasure. Well, they're blind if they don't see that. <laughs> Aww. Thanks. Yes. Well, Liz, I'm, I'm so glad well, we got to do this, and I hope um, you have happy holidays and you continued having success uh, with your art. Thank you so much. And again, do send me a, a, a link to your podcast. I absolutely will. And you have yourself a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Elizabeth Hipwell. Ain't she a sweetheart? Thank you so much, Liz. I'm glad we got to talk. You really are charming. You really are nice. And your mom would be, I know she is, not would be, she is proud of you because you have carried out her legacy. And that is just extraordinary. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. 
Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.